Thank you very much for that introduction, Simon. Um, I was asked to introduce or to open the conference by welcoming you here, so there's welcome in large friendly letters. Um, I think this is a, a, an extremely important conference. I think the issue of computing in schools um, is one that, that, that's attracting a lot of attention at the moment. Now, you're probably wondering um, why I'm opening this conference, since I don't teach at schools, and Simon's already given the game away on this. Um, I'm chairing the advisory group to a Royal Society study, which is looking into computing in schools, and the motivation for this study has come up very much from the bottom um, through groups such as this and the BCS, and, and, and the concerns that you've been expressing over the state of computing in schools across the country. Um, so I'm really just the front man at the Royal Society for something which I hope will ultimately help your cause. But Simon said he wanted me to say a little bit about my background as well. So um, one of the strange coincidences that sometimes happen in life is uh, I assembled uh, the advisory group at the Royal Society and uh, a name that was put forward was, was Neil Sheldon, um, who's from Manchester Grammar School, which is where I went a very long time ago. And it turns out that Neil actually introduced me to computing at school. Um, back in 1970, uh, he made an arrangement with Imperial College whereby uh, the boys at the school could write programs uh, where write is a bit of a strange word to use. Um, these were then posted, because they were on 80 column cards, they were posted to Imperial College where they were fed to some computer or other and about a fortnight later um, a large piece of good old-fashioned printout came back and told you which line you got wrong. Um, in, in fact, we didn't have a card punch at school what we got were 80 column cards that were pre-punched um, and, and they could only pre-punch every other column or the whole card collapsed. So they were actually 40 column cards. Every other column of an 80 column card had all the little squares slightly pre-punched and you could push these out with a sharp implement. Um, and, and, and that's how we wrote programs. And there was the two week debug cycle, which I think is an excellent discipline that should be reintroduced. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and, and the other irony of this is, is in working with these cards and writing our programs, I have this slight suspicion that, that 41 years ago, we were getting a better experience of computing than many kids get at school today. And uh, I think that's why you're here, okay? I'm, and I'm sure that's not the case in your schools, um, but... Uh, in a lot of schools, I think it is. Um, so I was introduced to computing at schools. Um, at university, I, I read mathematics, if that's not a strange phrase. Um, but while I was at Cambridge, um, I joined a student society called the Cambridge University Processor Group. And this was a society of students who built computers for fun. And I thought this sounded like an interesting thing to have a go at. And so in about 1977, I joined this society, and uh, the first computer I built um, is still sitting on the top of a, a bookcase in my office, and the, the, it's photographed here. It was all hand-assembled. I even made the, the card frame myself because I couldn't afford the commercial ones. Um, and I, I basically was self-taught building machines. And through the Cambridge University Processor Group, I got drawn into the embryonic acorn computers, um, who were building things that don't look very different uh, from the way I built my first computer, their chips exposed on boards and so on. Now, some of you will have come across an account of uh, this stage of my history. Um, <coughs> in the form of Micromen, um, which was a BBC4 uh, dramatization, uh, particularly focusing around the BBC micro history, and this is me according to micro men. Um, now, now I have to point out the portrayal was not accurate in many details. Uh, so, um, for some reason, I was portrayed as a chain smoker, and I haven't had a cigarette since I was 12. Um, 
that's, that's another story. Um, I have a beard though, I've never had a beard. Glasses, well I didn't start wearing glasses till my mid-40s, uh, but I will confess to a slightly strange taste in tank tops in those days. <laughs> Uh, anyway, if you want to know what, what, what I really look like, um, that's about the same era. Um, and uh, you can see in those days I had hair, but not on my chin. So. Um, anyway, my involvement with ACORN um, led to, uh, through to the development of the BBC Micro, which was an extremely exciting time um, for me, and I think for a lot of people involved in computers in this country. Um, we really hadn't appreciated even though we were in a company that was trying to build computers uh, for the market, we, know, we, we hadn't appreciated just how big the demand would be uh, for these machines. Uh, and I well remember the, the discussions with the BBC where they confidently said that with their programs, Acorn would sell 12,000 of these machines. And uh, that 12,000 rapidly became one and a half million, um, which, which shows just how little people appreciated um, what the demand would be when we could supply a suitable machine. Now, that's the marketing department's view of the BBC Micro. Um, my view is more like this. I was uh, principally involved in the hardware, and inside there you'll see the microprocessor in the middle, which just looks like a black chip. That's a 6502. Uh, but on the BBC Micro, which had 102 integrated circuits, if the PCB was fully populated. Um, there were, most of the chips were off the shelf, uh, but those two were designed specifically for this machine, and each of them reduced the chip count by about 10 or 20. Um, and I was closely involved in the design of those two semi-custom chips, and basically that set my career up, because ever since then I've been involved in chip design, um, and, and that's still my area of research today. And uh, you'll know that following on from the success of the BBC Micro, uh, by strange means, Acorn ended up designing its own microprocessor. Um, and that microprocessor has, again, through a series of serendipitous occurrences, um, ended up uh, basically dominating the world's supply of computing. I think if you look at the amount of computing power that's now shipped with the ARM architecture, it exceeds everything else produced by everybody else ever in the history of computing put together. Um, and uh, ARM shipments have, have, are well past the 20 billion mark. Each ARM processor requires about 100,000 transistors. It's quite simple by today's standards. And if you look at that big number of ARMs and the big number of transistors on each ARM, you get this magic number about 10 to the 15 which by a coincidence worthy of Douglas Adams, um, in other words, it's completely unrelated, um, is, 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 is equal to the number of connections between the neurons in your brain. And if you want to know where that leads, then I'm giving a seminar in the session at 11 o'clock that will develop that theme. But anyway, I'm here because um, the Royal Society um, heard the case for doing a study of the state of computing in schools and uh, I was asked to chair the advisory group. The uh, background to the project is rather wordy, um, but what really impressed the Royal Society was they, they called a meeting of stakeholders, and they got teachers and university folk and industrialists and e-skills and BCS all in the room, and this bunch of people hadn't got together, but they all sang from the same hymn sheet when they got there. They all said, we have a problem. And, and the Royal Society was sufficiently impressed by this consensus right across the spectrum um, that they agreed to set up this study um, and see if they could get to the bottom of what was going on. Now, just one of the bits of data um, that fed into this motivation was statistics on the number of school pupils taking A-level computing which has uh, more than halved over the last 10 years. Um, so there are, there are many other data points that all, all point in the same direction, that uh, something isn't going quite right in, in terms of engagement with computing in schools. Um, we're only in 
partway through the study, so I can't present any conclusions, but the kind of, of, of feeling that's coming through is that you know, computing is portrayed as just ICT, um, and there's the confusion between ICT, which is using computers to do useful things, which is important, um, but it certainly doesn't give you a sense of the excitement and potential of computing as an advanced and challenging subject. It, it, it's all just a bit mundane. Um, there's the issue of teacher qualifications, um, where most teachers teaching ICT have no qualifications at all in ICT. Um, there's the issue of the curriculum. What is the national curriculum doing? Um, it turns out, actually, the national curriculum allows pretty much anything. Um, but it doesn't disallow very boring solutions. Um, and, 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 and if you take that together with league table pressures um, and the skills of the teachers, it seems you end up with a lot of schools teaching very lowest common denominator computing within the national curriculum constraints. Teacher specialism, um, support for teachers, continuing professional development. The, the, we're looking at these areas and several others. Um, I don't have time to present um, the full picture, um, but I guess most people in the room already know this is going on and, and, and know where to find the details. We started um, middle of last year. We had a call for evidence late last year. And again, the Royal Society was very impressed by the number of responses they got um, to this call, the consultation. I think there was something like 125 responses um, from all sorts of organizations and individuals, um, including some school kids um, effectively submitted uh, responses. Um, research has been commissioned and has gone on earlier this year. There's, there's still some research taking place. We've had a series of stakeholder engagement meetings, um, engaging with teachers, head teachers, industrialists, and so on. And uh, we are due to put the final report together over the next few months. And uh, it will be a report of the Royal Society, not of the advisory group. So it has to be drafted, then it has to go to the Royal Society Council. It has to be approved by council. And then when it is published, um, it will be published with the full weight of the society behind it. And of course, as it happens, the National Curriculum Review has got underway in parallel with this. It, it, these were not timed very carefully relative to each other. Um, but the Royal Society um, officers have engaged quite closely with the Department of Education in terms of, of the handling of the National Curriculum Review, the precise outcome of which is, of course, entirely unpredictable. So that's what we're doing. Um, I'm here, I'm giving a, a talk on more related to my research at 11 o'clock, uh, but just to close, repeat my welcome. Um, I hope you have a good day. Uh, I think what you're doing here is extremely important and uh, I wish you well with it. I'll be here till about midday. Um, we have our external examiners meeting back in Manchester this afternoon, so I have to run at about midday. Thank you very much. Thank you.